So the anchor and senior editor of the Agenda on TVO, Steve Pakin has moderated leaders' debates for three federal and two provincial elections, has written five books, and has created several documentaries. Whether in front of the camera or live audience, Steve always brings an intelligent analysis to top headlining stories, be they local, national, or international. Just to give you a flavor of some of Steve's books and, and what he's written about and what he has interest in, um, his latest one is called Pakin and the Premiers, a personal reflections on a half century of Ontario's leaders. He wrote a book, The New Game, where he looked at the history of hockey and the changes that have shaped the game. In 2005, he penned Public Triumph, Private Tragedy, The Double Life of John P. Robarts, one of Ontario's pre premiers. He's also written uh, The Life, The Seductive Call of Politics, and The Dark Side, The Personal Price of Political Life. One of his documentaries is Return to the Warsaw Ghetto. It was a Silver Screen Award winner at the U.S. International Film Festival, and sorry, Film and Video Festival, and uh, also won awards at Canada's Yorkton Film Festival and China's Shanghai Film Festival. In June 2013, Laurentian University named Steve their second chancellor. And in December of 2014, he was appointed a distinguished visiting professor at the RTA School of Media and School of Jour Journalism at Ryerson University uh, starting about a year ago. <clears throat> Most of you do know Steve is originally from Hamilton. He was educated also uh, at University of Toronto and at Boston University, so that explains why he comes back for the Hamilton Tiger Cats and is a Boston Red Sox fan. Uh, Steve, for sure, is no stranger to Hamilton. Um, he's back quite a while, and we welcome him back amongst his friends tonight. Let me just start here and then I'll go over there. And can I, um, can I invite my other panelists to come up uh, and join Carlo up here on stage, Tim, Savon, and T Terry. Uh, just come on up and I'll kill a little time up here because there are a few clarifications I need to make. Uh, I'm not a Red Sox fan because I went to Boston University. I went to Boston University because I was a Red Sox fan. It was the other way around. So let's get that straight, first of all. Second of all, you know, one of the things that I'm going to regret for the rest of my life is that I didn't get, as I, I, I often get back for the Ticat games, I did not go to the game this past weekend because at the beginning of the season, I was so convinced that they were going to win the East and there would be no semifinal in Hamilton that I took our annual NFL road trip this weekend. So I saw a really average game in Nashville this past weekend and missed the phenomenal game here in Hamilton this weekend, which is too bad. And the last thing is, Keenan, where are you? Keenan. Okay, I don't know who gave you the script on that descriptor of my brother, but I think you described him as the distinguished Jeff Pakin. I don't know who the hell you're talking about, really. I mean, that's just so not accurate, you have no idea. I know you're trying to be nice. I know he's got a front row seat and he thinks he's distinguished, but trust me. Distinguished? Come on, who are we kidding? Fox. I'm, back me on this, right? He's not distinguished. Okay, let me come on over here now. Sean, Dave, we got this working? Beautiful. Okay, let's follow up. First of all, uh, I know you applauded once for him already, but Carlo, where are you? I'm here. That was, I'm a, fan I'm that was a fantastic I'm presentation. Tweeting. Can we welcome him once again? That was just great. <laughs> there is, and, and let's get into this right now. I think all of you uh, will know our panelists up here tonight. Sevan Pelvetsian is the president and CEO of Civic Action. She's SP, I'm SP. She's been on the agenda a couple of times. Not in a while, though. We we'll should be get, back. We'll we, be back. You will be we'll back. Be we'll back. get you back soon. Uh, your regionalness, Terry Cook is here, <laughs> former regional chair of Hamilton Wentworth, now president and CEO, CEO of the Hamilton Community Foundation. Uh, Tim Potisic is here, co-founder of the Super Crawl, fantastic event, Citizen of the Year in 2013. What year were you uh, Citizen of the Year? Tw he was 2012. So he, he actually beat you as Citizen of the Year. See, again, my brother not so distinguished because Tim beat him as Citizen of the Year by one year. Uh, let's get into this. There is, I think Carlos put his finger on the fact that there is a certain uh, fascination right now, an appeal with what's authentic, what's gritty, uh, 
you know, kind of those cool elements to build a city around. Sev, let's get into this. Uh, how, do you, how do you make sure, there's, let's put it this way, there's a fine line between sort of gritty and authentic and New Jersey. And we don't want to, <laughs> right? Now, we want to be, you know, Hamilton to Toronto, Brooklyn to Manhattan, as opposed to Brooklyn to New Jersey, Hamilton to New Jersey. Um, give us some of your thoughts on how you get more authentic and not run down. It's a fine line. I'm sure it is. So I, w I would say interesting a couple of things. First off, and I want to thank Keenan and the great team uh, for putting together this amazing event and for bringing up such a distin distinguished American. I think it's fascinating. And, and this is one of the things that unifies us as Canadians, that we can't help but figure out who we are by looking south of the border to find an American counterpart to compare ourselves to. And listen, we found a good one because Brooklyn is clearly doing a lot right. But, but rather than think about what cities in America, uh, Canada can look to to compare for or against as it relates to that passion and that grittiness and that innovation, I think what we heard from Carlo and what we saw this afternoon from the tour and, and all of us who, who spend time in this great city, we don't have to look much further than our own municipal boundaries. And in fact, at Civic Action, obviously, we're thinking not just about the municipal boundaries, but about the city region, because that's really what, what Carlo helped us to reinforce. Brooklyn is two and a half million people. That's Toronto. So we are not thinking about the perforated edges anymore of city life. How we live and work and play is about that city region. And when you're as big as Brooklyn, and you have 170 metro stops or subway stops, that's more than the TTC. I mean, TTC is about 69 total. So we're comparing the wrong apples and mangoes. We got plenty of apples and mangoes right here, folks. And while it's great to look south of the border to look for inspiration in new ways, we have all the ingredients here, and it's not necessarily about being too gritty or too edgy. It is about being authentic to what we have in our package. Fair enough, but Terry, are there... Sure, applause, applause. That was good. <laughs> Have, having said that, it's not wrong to learn from the experience of others, and if Brooklyn is doing something that this city needs to be aware of or may even want to, heaven forfend, copy, that's okay, isn't it? Of course it's okay, as long as we don't suggest that their experience necessarily translates here. It's a different legislative environment, it's certainly different in scale, but what I think is similar is when you look at the trajectory of New York, a city that was bankrupt in 1974 or 75, um, the great thing for Hamilton was not that we were in competition with, with Toronto. In fact, for many years it was the thing that buoyed this local economy. When People who had worked in heavy industry couldn't find jobs. They worked in the skilled trades in Toronto. That sustained us. We never saw real population loss. We never had the tough issues around school desegregation that you continue to struggle with. And frankly, in terms of starting point, while we're perhaps 20 years removed from where you're at in your trajectory, I happen to think that we have a lot of assets here that, that I, I put on the bargaining table as pretty good starting points. And I love to learn from Brooklyn and Philly and Pittsburgh and Portland all of them have lessons for us, uh, but we have to understand that we're gonna succeed, first of all, by understanding we're part of a larger city region, and to the extent it does well, we will do well, and to the extent we can build on the authenticity and the grittiness that's here, I think we'll be successful. We're just at a different point in our evolution. Let me follow up on that. Carlo, I was live tweeting your speech. I and, saw. <laughs> and uh, did get some, the lovely thing about that is, you know, as I was doing it, I was getting feedback from, from you know, people who are ever following it. And, and Tim, somebody said to me, um, okay, learn from Brooklyn, but follow your own path. Very important to follow your own path. Do you think this city's doing that? Oh, most definitely. I think Hamilton has, uh, uh, from, from the culture perspective, because that's where I speak from, uh, we've had a very strong cultural presence in Hamilton, and it's always been, it's always, boy, it's come up, it's gone down. It's come up, it's gone down, but it's always been here. And now we're the talk of the town, so to speak, with respect to people from Toronto. When you talk to Toronto, artists are flocking here. And they're flocking here because Hamilton is the real deal. When you've got guys like Tom Wilson, um, you know, multitudes of artists in town that, that are, you know, really true Hamiltonians that speak about Hamilton as an amazing town and have for their entire career, even when it wasn't spoken about as an amazing town. Um, we're starting to, uh, you know, basically, you know, the the surrounding regions are starting to look at look at Hamilton as a cultural mecca, 
and they're flocking here, and it's a fantastic feeling. Okay, you'll all understand that my job up here is to push back a little bit on some of what I've heard here. So, Carla, let me, let me sure. gently go at you a bit here. I'm from Brooklyn. You don't have to be gentle. <laughs> Good point. Good point. We, we get bored with gentle. Okay. <laughs> well, then let's hit it on the head. Did you guys get lucky because you had a rich guy come in there, wanted to put up a brand new hockey arena, which managed to attract some teams that were doing lousy <laughs> elsewhere, and therefore you got this gift that kickstarted so much of what you're talking about? I, totally, totally wrong. So, with all due respect, <laughs> well, no, totally it, wrong. It was a question. It was so, phrased as a question. It was phrased as a question. The answer is no. Um, the, look, Barclays Center is a billion-dollar investment. Any city would want a billion-dollar investment. But Barclays Center is part of a 25, 26-acre uh, development called Pacific Park that will have thousands and thousands of units of housing, both affordable and market, a new public school, eight acres of open space, a uh, new office building, et cetera. That's one thing. So the Barclays was a catalyst for redevelopment of one piece of Brooklyn. But remember, Brooklyn is huge. So the investment of saying, hey, you have these six piers uh, that are right under the Brooklyn Bridge that overlook the, one of the world's most beautiful skylines, Manhattan. Uh, why are they derelict and why is no one there? Well, now it's a 90-acre park called Brooklyn Bridge Park where millions of people visit and new residential, new hotels, uh, new restaurants, etc. So there are pieces of the puzzle that are happening all across the borough. Uh, and there's the development. And, you know, people, I know in Brooklyn, uh, I've gotten beaten up at a lot of meetings about development. I am pro-development. Why? Because development brings people. And tall buildings are not just looking at, ooh, look at that beautiful building that's glass. No, I'm looking at the thousand people that are living there that are going out at night in downtown spending money. So we didn't get lucky. We fought for Barclays. We fought for the Nets. We fought for the housing. Uh, but you know what? Yeah, now we are getting the roses of it, and, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, far be it for me to correct the pronunciation of a Brooklynite, but, yes. but I believe it's pronounced huge, huge. not huge. 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 I think it's huge. Huge. As in huge, baby, huge. You know? So it's almost like use as opposed huge. to you. Exactly. The plural. Okay. <laughs> Having so, okay, take your point. Having said all that, Sev, when it comes to... <laughs> <laughs> you still with me? I don't know where we're going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when it would, wouldn't it be great for? Or I, I should ask: Is it great for city building if you got a billionaire who's prepared to put a ton of money into redeveloping one part of town, which presumably acts as a catalyst to so many other things? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's hard to find something wrong with a billionaire whenever he or she would get involved. So absolutely. Unless he's a president. Oh, unless what? Unless he's your president. Well, well, that's for another topic, Terry. That's another day. But, you know, one of the things that we haven't yet talked about but I think is so essential is, is the transportation link. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Carlo mentioned that every year they lose $6 billion a year from folks who are from Brooklyn who take their money and spend it somewhere else. We lose $6 billion a year in congestion because our people and goods can't move from spot A to, to spot Z, as you would say, south of the border. So, you know, you have the advantage of being, what, 13 kilometers from Manhattan to Brooklyn. That's a healthy jog before OJ in the morning. For someone from Hamilton to get to Toronto, that's a full marathon and a half, which only Terry Cook could do before OJ in the morning. So I think there's an element of transportation accessibility that weaves its way into the success story of Brooklyn and into the city region that we know as the, of the GTHA. We're seeing the next chapter of investment that hasn't taken place in my entire lifetime finally start to show up. Uh, and it's not in the form of a billionaire who floated down from heaven, though it could have probably happened and would have made things a lot easier. But it is in the form of governments that are getting the fact that infrastructure is not a nice to have, it's a must have. And you cannot have quality of life if you do not have the veins of life through multiple mediums and, and, and multiple channels. And the LRT that's gonna be running through this town is a great example of that, but there needs to be much more and it need, needs to include the bike lanes and the other pieces that round out the complete life that is quality of life that is so that is so special here. What do you imagine the LRT will do to this downtown? 
It'll do what transportation, I think, does to every, every town, Steve. And, you know, we have 2.4 million people cross municipal boundaries in our region a day. Think about that. 2.4 million people cross boundaries. And that's to get to your job, that's to get to your specialist appointment, that's to visit your grandparents. So it is, it is a essential ingredient to having uh, the life that all of us aspire to have. And let me say, for millennials in particular, so we do have in the audience tonight, 27 of our civic rock stars, our, our diversity fellows. And you know, you ask these folks, what kind of life do you want to aspire to have in a city? My staff doesn't even have a driver's license. Like literally, if I had gotten, you know, if I couldn't have a drink tonight because I'm their drive back to the, to the big city. So, so being able to have transportation not only moves goods, not only moves people, but it's also what the millennials need to have to find a quality of life. The, the only thing I would add to that is today as part of the tour, I saw your older rail station that's now an amazing event space and a new rail station. But then I looked around there and there was nothing there. So, yes, in New York, I can tell you, and the U.S. is in terrible shape with our infrastructure. We know that. In New York, both the Bloomberg administration and the de Blasio administration today are realizing that we're probably not going to build all these new subway lines in the next 30, 40 years. Then let's invest where we have trains. So in my opinion, that area by that rail station should have 30 or 40 buildings there with thousands and thousands of people living there. What, what kind of buildings are we talking Whatever about? Whatever you want, whatever works for Hamilton. Whatever is the Hamilton answer or the Hamilton thing, and you guys are gonna decide what that thing is, because it's about you, make it there. Because if you can get to Toronto in a nice train ride, or you can get anywhere in Canada or wherever, imagine getting off the train, having 10 restaurants, bars, dry cleaners, clothing stores, and thousands and thousands of apartments, all within a walk to a train station. That's how you build a city. Terry, on the LRT, what do you imagine it will do for the city? It'll densify it, it'll strengthen the tax base, it'll attract young people who we know are not inclined to buy their own cars and want to be fossil fuel dependent. Uh, it'll renew the, the way in which the place thinks about itself. And I hate to remind for those of us who are old Hamiltonians that in 1977 or 78, when my grandfather ran the Transit Commission here, this community was chosen as the prototype for the government of Ontario's rapid transit system that ended up after a 14 to 12 negative vote by our regional council ending up as a sky train in Vancouver. Anybody who wants to track the relative development, progress, and vitality of Vancouver over the subsequent 30 years would be, I think, reminded that you get a once in a generation opportunity to take advantage of higher levels of government prepared to invest in infrastructure. That window is now and in Hamilton, and it inevitably has to tie land use planning to that significant investment in transit, both the GO service and, and the LRT. We can't afford to let another generation pass, because that investment, that opportunity, will go elsewhere. Make no doubt about it, we are in a competition here. Now, I think one of the other yeah, things I just want to, nice job, Terry. <laughs> I just wanted to add the one thing which what, what you, uh, Carlos was saying was one of the most important things is getting people downtown. Well, that's the one thing it's going to do. It's going to make it so easy for people to get downtown and those downtowners to get back into the burbs, get to the GO station, to get to Toronto if they're working in Toronto. And uh, it's just going to make it generally easy for us to get around. And it's going to help redevelop our downtown and bring it back to, you know, better than the days it's ever been its best. And I, sh I should add one other thing, because I know I talked about it and we talked a little bit about the young people moving into the downtowns and it's cool and it's great. But in Brooklyn, there's another demographic moving into the downtowns. It's the parents of the young people who say enough with the suburbs, enough with the taxes, enough with shoveling snow and all of that. It's basically, I want to live in a nice building where I have a gym, where I can walk outside, and I don't want to cook every night, and I can go out to eat three or four nights a week, and I can catch a show, and you know, be closer to my kids who now live in the city, see the grandkids more often, and it is, it is an enticing thing for all of you in Hamilton to figure out how to get the baby boomer generation 
back into the cities from the suburbs. It's a challenge, but if you do it, much more than the young people, and sorry for all the 20-somethings in here, remember the baby boomers have the money, and they're the ones that are more likely to spend the money on the restaurants and all the things you need for the tax base. Let's also remember they started downtown right. and moved out to the burbs, so it should be easy for us to convince Bring them, them to back. come down. Bring them back. <laughs> on that front, I'm, now, I'm going back 40 years here when I say this, and Seb, neither you nor I, I think, are probably experts on downtown Hamilton today. Having said that, 40 years ago, it was the place to go when you were a high school kid in this town. For me, living up on the West Mountain, you hopped the bus, you went downtown because there was lots of stuff to do. My sense is that's not the way it is anymore. Now, I know you guys went on a tour today, but you actually didn't go on Main Street. You actually didn't go on King Street. You went on James Street, where some of the funkier stuff in town is happening. So, okay, Seb, tell me, what do you do to try to bring back a downtown that's seen better days? Mm. Well, 40 years ago, I was a fetus, Steve. <laughs> uh, I was so, five. <laughs> so so I room. shall infer what was happening that in Hamilton me. at the time, but thank you, Mr. Pagan. Um, look, the, a city... It's a tough crowd tonight, tough crowd. <laughs> a city like any product is the sum of all the conversations taking place about it. That's your brand. Your brand is the sum of all the conversations taking place about you. And 40 years ago, the sum of all the conversations taking place about Hamilton may have painted a certain picture of what Hamilton was. But the sum of all the conversations taking place about Hamilton today and especially today, paints a very different picture for what this city is. We don't have to necessarily hold down the rewind button of history to fix pieces or address pieces. We actually just need to listen to what the, the pieces of the moment are and think about the right planning infrastructure that need to get us there tomorrow. This isn't actually rocket science. This isn't rocket science. You know, I was just in Atlanta a couple weeks ago touring the Beltline, this extraordinary 22-mile loop that's bringing Atlanta back, bringing Atlanta back. And when I listen to Carlo this afternoon speak, when I'm in Atlanta, when I'm talking to the folks from Austin, Texas, you know what? Every single city that's seeing revitalization includes the exact same ingredients. Carlo touched on it in his presentation this afternoon, and it talks about the, the bringing the energy back to the downtown core. That's code, that's code for being uh, for being authentic to who it is you were from your original spirit, but being smart enough to realize that the future can't, can't reflect what the 40-year vision was. 90% of businesses in Brooklyn are 20 people and, and less, small businesses. And so that pickle company and the t-shirt lady, and that's sort of the vision for what the downtown Absolutely. and the future has to be, not, not us getting so hung up on what it once was and, and trying to go back to those golden days. Okay, fair enough, but let me, let me follow up on this. For, for a long time, this city has been, try, has been trying, and I think seized of the idea of trying to get a National Hockey League team here as an anchor to kickstart all kinds of development in the downtown. <laughs> Okay, so we got to take an exit stage left, Snagglepuss, yes. and tease Carlo. Uh oh. Because when you met him, you, you started talking hockey in the Barclays Center, and you said, "In we have the island." Carlo, your accent reminds me exactly of Gary Bettman, and he said, "Who the hell is Gary Bettman?" <laughs> I mean, that is exactly the disconnect between the Canadian context and the American. What do you want to know about hockey in downtown? The question is, do, do you think, do you think, in order for the downtown to <laughs> achieve all of its potential that you need, a National Hockey League team here in an arena that will kickstart all kinds of development around it. Is that still the dream? I, I don't think so. I think for many years it was. I think the reality, just because of you've written more about this than, and you're a hockey guy, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I suspect territorial rights and a whole lot of other complexities are gonna keep this town from, aspire, from, from an NHL team. But I want to go back to your point about what's working downtown and what isn't. Because as much as I'd love to take experience from great cities like Brooklyn, we've got our own learning lab that is James Street North, where this guy's done a whole lot of good things, and the arts community has really generated momentum. But we forget that there were a couple of fundamental things that happened that preceded much of that, that momentum. And that was, first of all, that the city took what formerly was the one-way Southern Express route for trucks coming from Burlington Street to come up 
three lanes of James Street North, uh, which obliterated the streetscape, made it unlivable to be there, and frankly killed small business. And the two major things that happened that began the renaissance on James North were A, the investment by the laborers union in an abandoned train station, because they saw a vision with a repurposed, historic, beautiful building. And secondly, a, a basic municipal planning decision, which was to widen the sidewalks and convert to two-way streets to at least give the place a chance to regenerate organically. And here we are 15 years later, and we've only taken tiny steps towards recognizing the lessons from this and many other cities about what attracts people to be in these places. A great experience. The opportunity to sit on a patio, enjoy a drink, talk to your spouse, enjoy the, the back and forth of traffic. You're not going to have that with a five-lane expressway on Main and King Street. The sooner we invest and learn from those lessons, the better. No, well, fair enough. Tim, can I get you on this issue of whether or not, you know, I'm not saying this is all that Brooklyn has done, but clearly the presence of the Nets and the Islanders and the Barclay Center has been a boon for development for you guys. It's been a good thing. Do they need that? Do we need that here in the city of Hamilton, downtown? Well, I, I think having great sports teams is obviously critical. I think we already do have some great sports teams in town. Um, I think developing and uh, learning from what we've done in culture is probably more critical to Hamilton's growth and excitement and vibrancy and what's happening in Hamilton um, and moving us forward with, with culture. We have such, I can't, I can't stress it, the base of culture in Hamilton is so intense and so um, ingrained in the entire downtown already. That's what we should be nurturing, that's what we should be spending money on, and that's what tourists are gonna come to Hamilton to see. But can I, can I just add something I said? <laughs> yes, clap for that, clap for that. Um, you know, the, the Nets and, and the Barclay Center, no doubt about it, was a critical investment. Um, but it worked because it sat on 12 subway lines and it just got people in and out from the region. But I really want to go back to something I said earlier. That train station, that walking out from the train station and not seeing a live soul is a problem. <laughs> so spend the money on rezoning buildings high. Like when you walk, you should look up and not just see stars, but see new residents sitting on their terrace, as you said, having a bottle of wine, and you just know they spent a lot of money to live there, and that money is going into critical infrastructure. Let me follow up you with- You gotta bring people to live downtown. Let me follow up with, with one thing we haven't touched on yet, and that is political leadership. Something I've been covering for 35 years almost. How crucial was a new way of thinking a new way of doing business in Brooklyn politically to whatever success you have achieved? I, I would say there were two things that were critical. One was the political re leadership um, and kudos to former Mayor Mike Bloomberg uh, who understood that in 2001 that you had to invest outside of Manhattan or New York City would never grow. Um, and to my former boss who was the borough president who got on the phone with Bruce Ratner for months and said, can you bring the Nets to Brooklyn? Can you bring the Nets to Brooklyn? And he was laughed at. Uh, and then after months of fighting, uh, the developer said, yes, I can, if I can build 5,000 apartments in doing that. I mean, so yes, political leadership critical, but, but and I, I really want to stress this, it's the people. That movement of people that said, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in New York for college. I really don't want to live in Manhattan anymore. It's too, like, Gucci and, and all these big names. I really want to live in some middle of nowhere called Williamsburg. It was the entrepreneur who said, you know what? I don't want to open up my pizzeria in Greenwich Village. I'm going to do it in Bushwick. Uh, those are the two things, the entrepreneur, the people, and the political leadership together created where we are today. May I pick up on this point on political yeah. leadership? Because, Steve, you're absolutely right. For, for decades, the sector that city built was largely the monopoly of government, right? And we would show up with our golf pencils and stand behind our cardboard cutouts and we would vote for our leaders and in effect, they would take on the business of city building. That's not how city building is done anymore. And, you know, in this room alone, on this stage alone, you can see people who do not necessarily have political roles, who play 
political, uh, uh, who contribute to the political process because they're city builders from different vantage points. You know, we've got, we've got Rob McIsaac here who heads the Hamilton Health Sciences. What HHS is doing, not only for the health services in, uh, here in this city, in this region, but also for the country as a whole is, is second to none. You've got Keenan Loomis, and while it's called the Chamber of Commerce, every time I talk to Keenan, we're not talking about commerce, we're talking about city building and what's happening outside the folds of what a traditional Chamber of Commerce may do. I think everyone has taken off their sectoral hats, and everyone's gotten involved in city building. It's sexy. It's a great thing to be part of. And there's another generation, by the way, that's coming up the ranks that is eager to take the baton and run with it. And they actually weren't raised with an expectation that a certain person with a certain title is the only group that gets to, sh to, to create these sort of city building conversations. They're expecting that city building is done as a collaborative thing. And, and so I can't wait to see the kind of results that come out of the energies with, with that base baked in from day one. Terry, I don't have to establish your bona fides on politics, you know how it goes, and you know that you often hear... I, I'm still in the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I only got them to amalgamate here in 2001. They haven't forgiven me. Yours was in 1898, and yes. they're just now getting over it. So <laughs> I'm still not over The it. arc of history is long. What about, what about the noise? I mean, I, I live in a city right now where the, the former mayor was uh, hostile to LRTs, didn't want them built, hostile to bike routes. Um, how you're laughing because there's a few other things about the ex-mayor that I haven't said. Okay, <laughs> we don't need to get into that. Uh, how often do you run into, well, we can't do that, we've never done it that way. Well, the, the great thing in Hamilton is that the conversation that Savan has just talked about is happening here at a level of sophistication and depth that we've never experienced before. And I would say, with apologies to those of us who have lived here a lifetime, and you know, I live a block from the house I lived in as a kid, but thankfully, most of my neighbors have changed. And many of them are people who have come here to carve out a better future for their kids, just as the previous that's, generation did that's to the train station. That's a critical thing in and, Brooklyn. And they don't suffer from that same insularity and that sense that we can't do things differently or we can't change travel patterns because we've always gone quickly from Westdale to Eastgate Square with synchronized lights and five lanes of traffic. They think differently about neighborhoods. And, and I think what is slowly changing here is a political understanding that in fact it is a collaborative dialogue that it isn't a top-down, the days of Robert Moses, you know, drawing a Over. line across Manhattan and bulldozing miles and miles of property aren't gonna happen anymore. We, we're, we're in an age of enlightened self-interest in which a broader part of the community is gonna participate in this, this conversation. And in Hamilton's case, we're fortunate that many of those people who have come here have lived other places and aren't burdened by the same preconceived notions that my generation was. When you deal with City Hall, Tim, what kind of political leadership do you see? I've, well, I don't want to be a downer, <laughs> but I'm going to be a downer. Okay. <laughs> City Hall, love you, I'm sure there's some of you in here. Staff, I'm sure there's a lot of you in here, but you've got to get, can I, can I swear? You the can fuck swear. out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> because being a guy in town. You sounded like a Brooklynite there for me. <laughs> You guys will get along well. We will. <laughs> Being a guy in town who doesn't just do, but I put my money where my mouth is as well, as little as I have, um, it's a huge challenge to, to do these developments in this city. And it's something that needs to be talked about. And, but, talked about, but we're already talking about it to death. So stop talking about it and let's just get out of the way and let people do what they want to do. So the small guy can develop a property, the mid-sized guy can de develop a property, and when we finally convince the Torontonians to come and actually put their money where their mouth is into this town and spend some money to build some nice big buildings in our core, they'll come and they can do it easily. Because right now, it's, it is not easy. I can tell you from personal experience, it is very challenging to redevelop properties in this city. That was a technical term you used there, wasn't it? Yeah? yeah. That's right, I use it every fucking day. Oh. <laughs> now, now you're sounding like a South Brooklynite. <laughs> Terry, I do want you to follow up, but first of all, can you just give us an example of how they don't get the F out of the yeah. way? What are you talking about? 
Uh, well, I mean, it, it can just be challenging from taking, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I sort of specialize in is taking old buildings. There's lots of them in downtown that, uh, that need to be brought back to life, and it's very, very challenging to do those projects. Um, because why? Because you're trying to fit new zoning bylaws into, uh, you know, a, a round peg into a square hole or a square peg into a round hole. And, um, you know, we, we need to, the building department, all, all the departments need to rally around trying to make these things happen because there's so many properties downtown that we don't want to see go away. But the easiest thing to do is take a bulldozer to them and knock them down. Um, so we've got lots of infill. There's lots of opportunity to build on the parking lots that we were talking about earlier. There's lots of opportunities to build on the sites that don't have buildings on them. But we also have to remember that we have to keep all those existing buildings that we do have that are run down and bring them back to life. And all those things, they all add up to it. I divide excuse me, add up to a diverse, uh, fun, cool, exciting town. Terry, you wanted to add? Actually, actually I, I, Steve, I, I think Tim's made the point well and more forcefully than I could. Um, <laughs> I run a foundation, I have to be more polite. Um, the, the one point we haven't touched on that I see as a looming threat to the renewal in this community, and I, I simply need to put it on the table, is um, the experience with folks who choose to come here to invest, to start a new life, to make a difference, um, is inevitably limited and calibrated by the quality of your public school system. And this is a struggle that your country and your city continues to go through. Your schools are more, more segregated today than they were when Brown versus Board of Education was passed by the Supreme Court. And our inner city schools continue to be highly impoverished, poorly performing, and frankly underfunded. And and uh, to the extent families choose to come here and want to be part of a neighborhood and give back, they don't all have the luxury of being able to send their kids to private school. If they're going to invest in and participate in the community, we need a school system and a sense of productive commitment to education that is a whole lot better than what we have today in this community. The findings in the Code Red report and the Spectator about graduation rates in the inner city are abysmal, frankly, and should be an affront to all of us. And we need to have that part of the economic development corporate conversation. When I was in regional government, one thing we never talked about when it came to how do you attract jobs and talent was what's the quality of public education? If it fails, frankly, at the end of the day, we are limited in terms of the renewal that we can achieve here. What's the edu that, That's well said. Thank you. <laughs> What's the quality of education in, public education in Brooklyn like these days? I mean, look, it's, it's like anywhere else, in, anywhere else in the world. You have neighborhoods that have incredible public schools, and you have neighborhoods that have some challenges. And I think the challenge that we all face particularly in the business community, is how do we invest in the public schools? And it's not just putting money. It's not just saying, well, here's more money, here's more money. It's what are we doing to invest in the critical thinking that's coming out? Why are we still teaching in the U.S. Uh, in a school system that was built 100 years ago, you know, when people took months off a year to go work on their farms? They shouldn't. Kids should be going to school. Uh, not taking two months off. We should have a longer school day. I mean, these are all things that are critical. Uh, I personally am a supporter of charter schools. I'm a supporter of public schools. I'm a supporter of Catholic schools. I'm a supporter of private schools, yeshivas. Whatever gets the job done, whatever works, however you can think outside the box, that's what you have to do. But we definitely have challenges. Okay. Let me go out on a bit of a tangent here. Don't take this question the wrong way, SP. Done. Yeah. But... Um, I always thought civic action was a greater Toronto area thing. You were wrong. We're Mr. in Hamilton Bacon. tonight. No. So uh, what are you doing here anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just so warm and hospitable. I couldn't say no. <laughs> Uh, no, we're a regional organization, so, but you're absolutely right. In our original days, so Civic Action, uh, for those who, who uh, aren't as familiar, Civic Action is an, a nonprofit organization that sits at the nexus of where all the sectors converge, and we try to tackle those big urban challenges that need an all-hands-on-deck approach, where leaders, both established and rising, can get involved and, and get on with it. And we, we say we're Civic Action, we're not Civic Chit Chat, so we're not interested in having the conversations where we're more interested in having the conversations that lead to results. And so when we were first incepted about 13 years ago, it was just for the Toronto area, uh, Toronto specific. But over those years, uh, and in the last six and seven in particular, the Im import of the region has moved front and center to our agenda. That was done uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that's how people live. 
And when you think about the factors that go into quality of life and that go into a prosperous economic area, the region matters. It also uh, you know, was done because of the driving force of many of our board members, including someone like Rob McIsaac, who, who saw ahead of the curve how the rise of the city region would dictate the rise and fall of certain municipalities. And so we live like a region, we think like a region, we work like a region, and so the H is proudly in the GTHA for civic action. Do we really think like a region? Do we really? Because the, I, I don't know, I'm asking here. It seemed, it's possible to infer that the priorities of people who live in Hamilton are not the same as the priorities of people who live in Oshawa, for example, which is, you know, as much as two hours away from here. Do we really think regionally these days? Well, you know what, the priority, I would suggest, Steve, that the priorities, when you boil them right down, really aren't that different. Everybody wants to have a job to get to, a means of transportation to get there, a roof over your head, a decent education for your kids, affordable daycare, so you have a place to put them, senior care when your parents need the, the assisted supported living that, that they have the dignity and right to have. I mean, when you boil it all down, it doesn't matter if you're in Brooklyn, if you're in 416, 905, 647, everybody wants the same thing. But when you realize, as we increasingly compete, not with Burlington down the road, not with Toronto down the road, but with international jurisdictions around the world, then we force ourselves to take our blinders and make them a little bit further out because when companies choose, and that will dictate how we rise and fall, our foreign direct investment investments will have a huge, increasingly even more so, huge role in understanding how successful we intend to be. And I'll tell you, companies that are picking Shanghai, you know, the Toronto region, they're looking at the big picture, which forces us to think about the big picture as it relates to housing affordability, transportation investment, public education investments, because the world won't choose us based on a little microscope, we shouldn't be focused on our own priorities in the same kind of microscope. Thank you for re-educating me on that. Incidentally, that was good. I want to put a new issue on the table here, and Carl, I'm going to start with you on this, because one of the words, buzzwords, I guess, we hear a lot about these days, necessary to bring cities back is either intensification or densification, that kind of thing. I want to know what kinds of fights you guys had in Brooklyn as you tried to convince neighborhoods that were accustomed to having bungalows or two-story homes, and that's it, to accepting four, five, six, maybe eight-story buildings, condos. Try are, 40, 50, and 60 Okay, story okay, even more, because it made more sense in terms of urban planning to put bigger, denser projects near them, even though they've never wanted that. How'd you deal with that? So I, I personally got beaten up a lot over it. Uh, we, the elected officials who supported it got beaten up a lot in it. Um, but we did it in a smart way. So we said, look, downtown Brooklyn is the core of our city center. There should be 80, 90 story buildings. We all agreed on that. But so while we were up zoning, and I talked a little bit about the Williamsburg Greenpoint waterfront, we also protected. So we didn't go into a neighborhood. You may not know Park Slope, for example. What you know Park Slope. Brownstones, tree-lined blocks. We never said, we're going to put up an 80-story building on a tree-lined block. But what we did say was, look, there is a street called 4th Avenue, which is a six-lane highway and blah, blah, blah. Maybe on that street with subway access, with a train stop every 10, 20 blocks, it makes sense to go up. But we will, at the same time, the side streets go down. So we protected the character of neighborhoods while upzoning uh, in transit-rich communities. And, and that's really the balance. Uh, so I'm not saying to you, go into one of your cute little neighborhoods and tear everything down and build up. But what I am saying is there are places where appropriate development is critical. Uh, we then had a rule that if you were putting a building up, you had to put ground floor retail. You had to make the streetscape alive because you don't just want buildings without retail. Uh, we wanted provisions for supermarkets because I don't know about here, but there are parts of Brooklyn that are supermarket starved um, because, and no offense to my banker friends in the room, the banks pay a lot of money 
for retail, the supermarkets don't. So we created incentives for supermarkets, incentives for daycare center, incentives for medical use, community facility, affordable housing. So now if you come to the city and say, gee, I want to go higher than I can, you can if you create affordable housing, community facility, medical, school, daycare, and you must have retail. And that was the balance of it all. And by the way, not everyone is happy, and too bad. Uh, understood, <laughs> yes. Tell me, the politicians who got beaten up over this, did, did some of them lose? The politicians who got beaten up were uh, wonderfully reelected. Uh, they they uh, were strong enough to make the tough decisions. Um, deals were made, of course, and compromises were made. Uh, and, you know, a politician who said, look, if you're going to rezone my neighborhood uh, along the water, I want open waterfront access for all people. That's a good thing to ask for. Or a politician who said, look, if you're putting up all of these buildings, you got to include public schools. These are good things to ask for. So we asked for things that the development community had to give back to the community they were building in, but we allowed them to build more in return for more. So we have hundreds of local, literally hundreds of local politicians you know, on the municipal councils all the way along the, the uh, south shore of Lake Ontario, around the top shore to Clarington or wherever it ends. Is that where it ends? In the East End? I don't know, Oshawa, wherever, in York Region. Are you saying courageous decisions will be endorsed and, and, uh, and therefore they should make them? They have to make them, because if they don't make them, then you made a good point. You're not competing with Toronto. We weren't competing with Manhattan. We're competing with the world. So believe me, if we're not making the tough decisions, trust me, there are other cities in the world that want development, that want the jobs, that want the people, and they'll make the decisions, and then we go backwards. So critical decisions, leadership decisions. By the way, if you can get something out of it for your community and your constituents, God bless you and you should, but if you're gonna be in the middle and in the way of progress, step aside, because it's gonna bulldoze you and it may hurt you in the end. Tim, what do you see in terms of this intensification debate in Hamilton? Are there people who are trying to get higher buildings built? Are there neighbors who are fighting back because they don't want it? Which way do the local politicians go on it? What are you seeing? Uh, well, it's all over the map. I mean, I think it's very important. I think the tall building intensification is extremely important. And again, in the right neighborhoods, in the right communities, you know, not uh, in, in um, uh, you know, streetscapes that don't, don't deserve those types of tall buildings, but it's absolutely essential to the rebuilding of downtown Hamilton. We have to have tall buildings and we have the places to put them. We just have to, you know, encourage the development community to come here to build them. Um, and you know that's sort of the bottom line. It's it, it, from from political perspective, we're definitely seeing um, you know the downtown ward councillors uh, encouraging these types of buildings as well, which is really positive. Terry, I'm going to ask you the same kind of question, which is, what is a local politician supposed to do when she knows that it's a good idea to have intensified development at a particular, say, transportation node in the city, but a lot of the residents are living near that who are going to be responsible ultimately for re-electing or not sure. that politician are opposed. So thankfully, having been elected barely out of my teenage years, my first major issue was an intensification issue, high rise building in an old brownfield site for which I got hung in effigy. City council meeting was adjourned while we called law enforcement to settle the crowd down. It went to the OMB, they built the buildings and guess what, I not only won six subsequent elections, I won the poll in which that building was built. Incumbents don't get beat about intensification Absolutely. if over the long term the trajectory of the neighborhood and the community is improving. Two points though. One is to the extent we have a once in a generation opportunity around transit, both GO and LRT, if we fail to bootstrap the need for intensification along the primary corridors, then we'll have lost and seen leakage of the tax base that we need to sustain and support that and the population base that will use it. And secondly, the piece we haven't talked about with my buddy McIsaac sitting in the front row is, um, when he did the green belt uh, around the GTA in Hamilton, it was precisely because we understood that there was a limited amount of 
well that we could continue to absorb while maintaining and building vital inner cities. And to the extent we defend tough urban boundaries and the need for intensified land use everywhere, city and suburbs, we're either going to succeed or fail. And I think that's different in a New York context. You didn't have to worry about folks building low density sprawl 10 minutes away. That's a different thing that we have control of that we have to address if we're going to succeed with a different kind of a future in Hamilton. SP, where do you think the debate on intensification is at today? Well, I think it depends on what year you were born in. <laughs> Here we go again. So, but, but, no, no, and I don't want to hear any F-bombs out of you down there, Tim, but <laughs> the reality, I mean, think of, so Toronto is a great example in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, I just took our seven-year-old up to the CN Tower for her first time. She got to see the city, and actually today on our tour, Keenan brought us up to the uh, Stelco Tower. We got to see this extraordinary 360 view of the city of Hamilton. I mean, it just, it was breathtaking. Um, the first skyscraper arrived in Toronto in 1967. And you know, when I took Zeta up and, and we stood and we had dinner, or lunch rather, $47 for, for a kid's meal at the revolving restaurant, the CN Tower, but anyway, uh, very expensive chicken fingers and fries, but we, but we saw all of the city and the thought that it was only 1967 that the first skyscraper was up, it blows my mind. So there is a different generation that's born with different expectations on what the layers of, how high the layers of history go. And I think so long as we honor our roots, Brooklyn has done a brilliant job of doing that. The development that we saw on our walking tour this afternoon has done such a brilliant job of that. You haven't tried to bulldoze your layers. Right. You've just built to top them where and how it makes sense. And, and, uh, and I think that is the future. Every year in the region, the GTHA, 150,000 people more arrive. Right? Well, there's already 42% of Torontonians that live in apartment buildings, 26% if for here in Hamilton. So it's not as if we can just continue to just get smaller, smaller, smaller in the existing spaces. We have to go up. But we have to do so with the dignity that history deserves so that we don't lose the character that we fought so hard to preserve. And when a politician says, I can't win re-election if I allow this kind of density in my neighborhood, <laughs> mm. Well, we what call then? Terry Cook and he runs their campaign. Well, <laughs> when given, given that... 95% of municipal incumbents get re-elected anyway. You have to r work real hard <laughs> to, to get defeated over <laughs> intensification. Okay, can I just make one other quick sure. historic parallel? Because the closer lesson, hearkening back to 67, was the relative position of Toronto to Buffalo. In 1967, Buffalo was a vibrant center of culture, sports, arts, population base of a million people, the best architectural base in Absolutely. the U.S., maybe outside of Chicago or Brooklyn. Yep. And in the subsequent 40 years, very different choices were made on the two sides of the border. Why was it that we continued to grow and prosper on this side and they didn't? And I would suggest to you that that's a complicated debate that would require alcohol, but we should reflect <laughs> upon it given where we are tonight. Okay, well, before we uh, induce any more comments <laughs> yes. with alcohol, uh, part of my job tonight is to make sure we stay on time. And to that end, I think we should give our friend from the States the last word on this tonight. Any parting words for us tonight, Carlo? You know, it's, uh, first of all, it's real, it's, and, and I really mean this, it's great to be here. It's uh, not something I thought I would do uh, again. It's, uh, you've taught me a lot about Canada. You know, the joke in the U.S., I shouldn't say this, don't tweet it, but the joke in the U.S., I'm sure you heard it, is that Canada is a lot like the U.S., but with better health care and stricter gun laws. So <laughs> congratulations on both of those things. Um, no more comment on that. Um, but your point is really important, the Buffalo-Toronto point, um, because you are, you are at that point right now. You can explode, you can embrace change, you can embrace buildings, you can embrace new things, uh, you can embrace people like you who are doing interesting, dynamic things and become the hub of the future, or you can fight and say no and say, oh, but I like this little bungalow, or I don't really want anything here, or the downtown you know, shouldn't be open till one in the morning or whatever your, your limits are. And if you do that, then unfortunately you will, you will almost be a Buffalo type. And then it will take you a long time because Buffalo is now coming back, but it's taken a governor, who's got a huge set of you-know-what 
to come in there and say, we are going to make Buffalo great again. Why do you want to get to that point? You're already on a great road. You have incredible natural resources. Uh, use what God gave you. Use the positioning. Use what you have. Just make it better. And then you will continue to flourish. And you are a great place. I mean it. And sell yourself and be proud of it. As we ask Keenan to come up on stage and wrap things up tonight, I know you all want to join me in thanking these great panelists for coming from near and far for a great discussion tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for keeping us on time. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you here. You are the best at uh, what you do, so thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to thank Carlo uh, so much for, for coming here, answering that call on, a, on Monday morning, and for following through and, and coming here and being a part of this, and to all of our panelists. Uh, we do have uh, gifts for all of our panelists, so from the Hamilton store. We stopped off uh, earlier today and, uh, and got those. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a sample, it's all a goodie bag full of uh, Hamilton, made in Hamilton stuff. But uh, I do actually have something for Carla, so I want you to, to come up here. You can wear it. Wear it right now. That would be great. Uh, yeah, and they won their playoff game yesterday, so it's, uh, it's perfect. If they didn't, I, I don't know if I would present that to you. But uh, <laughs> uh, So thank you uh, again to all of our panelists and to Carlo. Um, I want to thank uh, RBC Royal Bank, Grant Thornton, and Hamilton Community Foundation for our gold level sponsorships. Uh, silver level sponsors, WestJet, Kojiko, and Cable 14. And thank you to Leuna 837 for sponsoring the uh, reception. Nice. It's a great brand, isn't it? Just, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I want to thank uh, Oscar Kichi and the Lincoln Alexander Center, uh, the residents of the Hamilton Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, and a leading downtown venue for arts, culture, and education. This was a great venue for this. I want to thank all the people who volunteered their time today uh, touring the Diversity Fellows around uh, Hamilton. And thank you so much to the Diversity Fellows and Civic Action Team for being uh, in Hamilton all day. Really appreciate that. Again, if any of you want to stay, we'd be more than happy to put you up. And uh, I want to thank, uh, more than anything else, my team, uh, in particular, Scott McCammon, Richard Allen, Julia Jorasoskis, and Whitney Eames. I have a great team that allows us to do these uh, excellent events. And uh, finally, I just want to thank all of you for making this a great sold out show. Uh, we're already working on next year's Ambitious City, so I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Good job.